Hello and welcome to Just Jets episode number 164. What is going on? I am Matt O'Leary back with another episode and we have a few things that I want to get into in today's episode one is David Bakhtiari saying what he would do potentially if he was the Packers GM with Aaron Rodgers. We have to get into the list of almost Jets that continues to grow and your questions in different form. We're not doing voicemails today. We're doing an Instagram Q&A. So I picked some of my favorite questions that were submitted there. But before we get into the full episode, the NFL draft is here. And the most exciting prospect is this prospect of being completely groomed from head to toe with our friends over at Manscaped. Manscaped has long had elite downfield play with their Lawmore 4.0, but in 2023, they have added the rookie sensation, the Beard Hedger, to ensure that the face of your franchise is a pretty one. This one-two punch of men's grooming is the best acquisition for any at-home GM. So go to manscaped.com and save some salary cap with our code JETS20, that is J-E-T-S-2-0 for 20% off plus free shipping. You'll be looking great over on draft night. All right, let's hop into today's episode. So David Bakhtiari thinks that the Packers could maybe refuse to trade Aaron Rodgers. He was on the Bussin' with the Boys podcast, a very popular podcast podcast featuring a couple a couple or well one former NFL player in Will Compton although I believe he's trying to make a comeback and free agent Taylor Lewan here is what David Bakhtiari had to say on the situation courtesy of bussing with the boys the Packers are rebuilding whether you think so or not they don't like they could they be good I don't know could they be bad probably if you're betting more people are gonna think they're gonna be bad than good Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. isn't that fair to say so then they'll be like well we're gonna suck anyways we want we want and we're not gonna bend anyone so we'll just eat it fair and retire we'll pay you we don't care because we're gonna if we're gonna do it our way it's gonna be on our terms if not what do we like we're we're gonna be super bowl contenders anyway so we'll eat it you can hang on the side pay you your money and then we'll suck anyways get the picks as compared to dealing him for something that you shouldn't have you could potentially look like an idiot to not only president and the board but everyone else around the league thinking of the gm's perspective put yourself on the hot seat and then potentially have your job come called to question. So I, I look at all these like ways you can you can deal it. I don't think you'd get that contentious. I do think they'll probably come to an agreement. He'll get traded. They'll get what they want. And then I will probably say whether it was who won, who won what. But I'm saying there, I do think that it could be a third option if things got so You're bad. right. You're right. I don't... <laughs> I can't wait for this to just be over because I am so over the takes. And David Bakhtiari did kind of walk that back a little bit at the end there. But I can't stand the Packers, not even really beat writers. It's really like the the bloggers or fan creators. So many of them, not all. There's some good ones that I've seen. There's been some pretty good videos recently that I saw and that I liked. But they are an insufferable group. I cannot wait for this to be over, but I don't see how or what benefit Green Bay would have from refusing to move him. Isn't that such a scummy move to for a guy who was one of their best players in franchise history? You could debate if he was the best or not. I think it's, you know, a reasonable debate or a reasonable topic of conversation to talk about if he is or is not the best player in franchise history for the Green Bay Packers. But He wants to move on. He made it clear. He talked about wanting to play for the New York Jets on Pat McAfee a month ago, like literally a long time ago now. And it's now, as of recording this, 16 days from the NFL draft. Like the NFL draft is so rapidly approaching that um, like this has to get done soon, at least in my opinion. I think it has to happen before the NFL draft. I think it makes sense for both sides to get this one done before the draft. Like, again, if you're the Green Bay Packers, what benefit do you have by just sitting there and saying, you know what, we're not going to take the draft capital for this year? Going, We're going to go all for Jordan Love. We're all in put moving to Jordan Love, but we're also going to pay Aaron Rodgers to sit at home and eat up a ton of our... What? Why? That's crazy. That's silly hours. It doesn't make sense. I I understand where where David's coming from here. I I get it, what he's trying to say. But it's just... I, I, I don't see how that could possibly be 
a realistic option for this team. I, I really, really don't. How, and the comments on some of this is like, oh yeah, I would. That's what I would do if I was Green Bay. I would hold them hostage. Why? That sounds like a terrible idea. Like one of the worst ideas you could possibly have. What kind of reputation does that have? Or does that set for your team? This this is my actually my favorite response. It's from KRNG Chris. It says, so he is saying they will gladly eat $120 million over the next two years, stunting the development of their young quarterback and get zero compensation while eating $120 million? Yeah, hire this man as the GM. This is why he plays and isn't working in the front office. That is, it's just so crazy. Why would they hold why would they hold him? And it's not like the Jets are saying, I don't think personally. It's not like they're like, oh, here's a seventh round pick. Give us Aaron Rodgers. I think they would be willing to give up a second round pick. And I think a big reason why they made the Elijah Moore trade was so that they would have another second round pick after giving one up. And the next year's pick will be conditional. And maybe there's a condition where it turns into a first round pick. If they win a Super Bowl, go to a Super Bowl, have a home playoff game. Rodgers on the team in 2024. Whatever you want to make the condition and maybe they do throw in a Corey Davis type of player. How many times have the Green Bay Packers said that they are looking for a veteran receiver? And before the comments say, well, they can't afford Corey Davis on their cap hit or on their with their salary cap right now. If you look at the Brandon Cooks trade, he redid his deal to, to go to the Dallas Cowboys. Corey Davis deal could get redone. It could get restructured. You can sign him to an extension and that changes your cap hit for this year. There are ways around it. There are ways that you could get creative with it. It's that that argument to me just never makes any sort of sense. Is when it's like, oh, they you can't uh, they can't afford that. There's ways to work around that. There are absolutely ways that they can work around it. I just uh, the out of touch levels. I think with some of these scenarios and some of the trades, like that one, for instance, is one that just really after a while it just begins to get to you. Now, the second thing I wanted to get into before we do your questions in the second half of the show is the list of almost Jets. So, obviously, the the latest is Odell Beckham Jr. And I, for one, I said in the video in my reaction on Sunday when we got this news late on Easter, I, for one, will not be crying over Odell Beckham Jr. not signing with the Jets for up to $18 million. $15 million for Odell Beckham Jr.? Look. Guys, again, he got pretty much a top 10 wide receiver contract money for not playing a single game in 2022. He played 14 games in 2021 and seven in 2020. He hasn't had an 1,000 yard season since 2019. Granted, again, injuries have played a factor in it. Quarterback play played a factor in it. And he did look good. Like, I'm not denying. In the Rams playoff run, he did look good. In those four games, he had 288 yards and two touchdowns. He was solid. 72 yards a game. He was playing good football at that point. But after another ACL, that's a, it's a risk. It is a massive, massive gamble. And he is going to be the number one wide receiver for the Baltimore Ravens. Thank God that wasn't the Jets plan for their number one receiver. And if this was, you know, we could have like a legitimate debate and be like legitimately angry if it was like a $5 million deal plus whatever with incentives. That's not what it is. He's getting $15 million that could go up to $18 million this year. That's crazy town. And he would probably be, what, wide receiver two? It would be him and Lazard fighting for wide receiver two. And you have other guys like Miko Hardman, and you know you go right down the line from there. I, I'm not super upset. Now you do have to pivot because I agree. I think they need another receiver. Whether that is, you know, keeping Corey Davis, maybe they do that, but I would prefer if for whatever reason, which seems like it's getting more and more likely if the Cardinals just end up flat out cutting DeAndre Hopkins, because no one's able, they're not able to get anything for him. That would be, that would be an interesting one to take a flyer on because he put up some good numbers last year with just some, Awful, and I mean awful quarterback play. Missed time due to suspension, but in nine games, he played He he played nine games, had 717 yards, which is 79.7 yards per game, and three touchdowns. 
by the end of the year, the quarterback that was throwing him the football was Colt McCoy, Trace McSorley, and David Blau. And he still put up those numbers. Paced out over a full season last year for, for DeAndre Hopkins. And he was inactive the final two. He was suspended the first six games and then was inactive the final two weeks of the year. I mean, at that point, why play him? His pace over 17 games was 1,300 yards and six touchdowns. That is a much bigger swing that I would be willing to... I'd rather take the DeAndre Hopkins swing than the Odell swing if they're going to be similar prices, which I think it's going to end up being. If DeAndre hit the open market, I think it would be a similar price tag to what Odell got. And Hopkins is the better player. I don't think that's up for a debate. Even in their prime, I think Hopkins was the better of the two. But both guys are at a similar point in their career. Both are 31. Hopkins was drafted in 2013. Odell was 2014. They bounced around the league a little bit. But I would, again, I would much, much rather take my shot with DeAndre Hopkins than go with Odell. Or even if you wanted to do Jackson Smith and Jigba, and I guess uh, there's a there's a Jackson Smith and Jigba question. So we'll hold off on really going all in on breaking that one down. But if you don't go for someone like a DeAndre Hopkins, you could pivot and do Jackson Smith and Jigba. Calais Campbell was a list on the almost jet, and that one was unfortunate. He just signed before he had the meeting with the Jets. I don't know what you could possibly do if you if you're Joe Douglas in that spot. It's not like he let him out leave the building. It's not. <laughs> he, he didn't take the meeting. There was nothing that you could do. And I liked Calais. I think that is absolutely someone that should be on the radar. Should have been on the radar for this team. He was on the radar, but he signed somewhere else. Fletcher Cox, the Jets offered him more money. Again, what do you want Joe Douglas to do? And he can't force, he can't hold him down and say, put pen to paper. He wanted to go back to the Philadelphia Eagles where he took less money to go back and finish what they started in, in Philly. I don't blame him for that. How could anyone blame him for that? Or, or blame Joe for that? What do you want? Again, what do you want Joe to do? Carr's another one. Like, oh, my God, we wouldn't have to be dealing with this right now if they just signed Derek Carr. He was in the building. He wanted to be here, blah, blah, blah. They made it clear all, pretty much from jump that Aaron Rodgers was their plan A, and I get it. I do. I like Derek Carr, and he was by far my second favorite option. If it was established that Rodgers wasn't a realistic target and they landed Derek Carr, I'd be happy. I'd say, okay, yeah, I get it. I understand why they did that. But when both are available and when it became clear that Aaron Rodgers wanted to come and play for the Jets, I don't blame them for wanting to go that route. I really don't. Especially when it's not going to take a first round pick to land the guy. I'd rather give up a, a second round pick for a couple of years with Aaron Rodgers than I would with Carr. Is Carr a good quarterback? Absolutely. Absolutely. He gets them to the playoffs last year. Certainly. Does he do enough to elevate them all the way up to Super Bowl status? Maybe. Maybe. But I, you know that Rodgers has a better chance of that. Even at this point in his career. Is it a guarantee for either? No. But if you're just saying odds-wise, chances-wise, which one gives you the better chance to win in a two-year window? It's Rodgers over Carr. I get it. And like again, we don't have to re rehash that one and completely revisit the history there. But I would have been okay with with, with Carr, but I'm not like none of the losing out on those guys is not going to derail your season. It's about how you pivot. The Jets still need to add more on the interior. You can do that. You can sign at Al Woods, and you could still draft someone in the middle rounds and probably be okay on the interior defensive line. Wide receiver, I gave you a couple other options right there as well. You could, get, you could acquire DeAndre Hopkins either via trade or via free agency if slash when he's cut. You can use your 13th overall pick on a guy like Jackson Smith and Jigba. And Carr they, was the one they missed out on. They're going to land Aaron Rodgers. So you can change that narrative pretty quickly. If, for example, it turn, if the, those guys of the list of almost Jets turned it into Al Woods 
Ben Jones, because we've talked about him for a while, and he's still available, and DeAndre Hopkins. Are we sitting there worrying about Fletcher, Calais Campbell, and Odell? Probably not. You, that probably isn't getting talked about nearly as much because, again, it goes back to how you pivot, and that's the biggest thing for Joe Douglas is, okay, you weren't able to land that those guys. Show me your full plan. It's still too early in the offseason. The draft hasn't happened yet. If you're at if you still have questions about who is playing center and who is wide receiver two or three and like who is playing on the interior defensive line next to Quinnen and we're in July, that's a different story. But we're still a couple of weeks out before the NFL draft, even guys. Remember Morgan Moses was signed late. Uh I almost said Daniel Brown again. I don't know why I keep doing that. Dwayne Brown was signed late last year. Guys have been added to this team at later points in the offseason and have played big roles. Morgan Moses was really good for the Jets a couple of years ago. Dwayne Brown was solid for the Jets last year when he played. If they were to add a, a Woods, a Jones, a Hopkins, someone else, they'd play a nice role. And again, like you have your draft class where you're going to have two picks in the top 50. And maybe you move back and get even more picks. That's an option. We did a mock draft on Monday this past week with options for you. If you wanted to trade back from 13, you move back. Maybe that's where you take a guy like uh, Darnell Wright out of, uh, um, I almost said Washington, out of Tennessee. He's a right tackle. I would be really, really surprised if he's a left tackle in the next level. But Right, getting a right tackle at pick 19 and picking up another second round pick. So you could have two second round picks while also trading one, your third, to uh, to Green Bay for Rodgers and potentially have three picks in the top, we'll call it 60. There are still going to be ways to add to this team. It's not anywhere close to a finished product yet. So while some of the guys on this almost Jets list is is annoying and it gets frustrating and I get it, let's not go completely nuts just yet. Without further ado, let's get into those questions and answers right now. First up, let's go to Roman Q on Instagram. He says, how likely is JSN at 13? If they do go JSN, what's the play in round two? Good question. Now, JSN at 13 is not my preferred method. It was definitely, I would say it was less preferred when they had Elijah Moore. But even still, with the need at wide receiver, it is still a need. It's not as big of a need as fortifying the offensive line, in my opinion. If one of the three guys, uh, Paris Johnson Jr., Peter Skaronsky, or Broderick Jones are there at 13, I think you have to take one of those three guys. That's my personal opinion. That's my personal preference. Now, if all three of those guys are off the board, and if you don't want to trade back, two names come to mind. JSN, Kalaja Kansi. Now, Kalaja Kansi isn't a sexy pick at 13, but he has the potential to be a really dominant pass rusher from the interior. And pinning him next to Quinnen would be a lot of fun. Would be a lot of fun. And couldn't you just see Robert Sala wanting a guy like that for his defense? You absolutely could. But for JSN specifically, I get it. I, I think he just doesn't have that same Garrett Wilson ceiling, but I think could be a steady number two option on this team. Steady number two option, which is important, which is what you what you need. It would be a wide receiver room of Garrett Wilson, JSN, uh, uh, Nicole Hardman, Alan Lazard as your top four. That's a really, really damn nice top four for your wide receiver room. And then in round two, I don't think that changes anything. I think you go right back to what my plan A would be, which is center. Even if you sign Ben Jones, who I talked about, I think you would still draft your center in round two. Hopefully, John Michael Schmitz is there. I don't think he will be. I think there's a chance he goes at the back end of round one or early second round. By early second round, I mean a top 40 pick. But that you can go Tipman, you can go Whipler. There are so many, there are a couple other options on day two who you can draft 
at center and say, all right, you're going to sit behind a Band-Aid fix for one year in Ben Jones. And if Ben Jones does get hurt, which is a, a red flag for him because he had concussion issues last year, then you at least have someone that's not like a sixth round guy who you're going to develop, but someone who can come in and you'd be comfortable playing in year one. I think Whipler or uh, Tipman or any of those guys, I think would be, I'd be comfortable with playing in year one if they had to in a worst case scenario. So that wouldn't really change my plan uh, if they do take JSN at 13. And if that's the case, again, I get it, but you're really, you're banking on Dwayne Brown returning and playing at a high level this year after surgery. He's up there in age. You're relying on Makai Becton staying healthy. If he does stay healthy, we, we saw what he can do as a rookie. When he was healthy, he was a damn good football player. He was a really, really good football player. He lost a ton of weight. I'm so happy for him. I'm rooting like hell for the guy. But th- there's risk. Max Mitchell was okay. He was better than what we thought he was going to be, but he was just okay. And he had blood clots at the end of the year. There's risk involved there. So, again, not my preferred plan, but I would understand why if they went that direction with JSN. I I would get it, especially with Elijah Moore gone. If Elijah Moore was still here, that's another conversation. Then I don't think we'd be having this conversation, but he's not here. Ron Boy is up next. He says, he asked, uh, is Joe Douglas trading back with Washington to 16 for another second rounder? That's that's interesting. That probably would net you another second round there. I'm going to look up the draft tech value chart. Uh, it's not a perfect like source. It's not like, oh, this is exactly it. Sometimes the value is slightly off. Um, Washington 16, right? Yeah. Okay. So that's three spots back. That's a, about a value of 150 points which is probably not a second rounder. The Washington second rounder, do they they even have one? They do. It's a pick 47, which is worth 430. So the Jets might have to kick something back. Like you might have to kick back. Maybe if they kick back 112, their fourth round pick. So you move back three spots, you give up a fourth round pick, and then you get your extra second then that is maybe more likely. But if you move back, I I think you have to drop to like 19 maybe to get another second without having to give up like a a day three kicker because 19 is 875 points. That's Tampa Bay. And their second round pick is they might have two. They have pick 50, which is worth 400 which is about 1275 to the Jets 1150 for which is the value of pick 13. That I think is maybe a little bit more likely, which is another three spots back. It was 16 versus 19. Um again, just moving back the three spots, I don't know if you could pick up just pick 47 and not have to worry about moving something else. Now would I do it? I probably would because that extra swing in the top 50 would be really nice and you know you're trying to get immediate impact guys for this run and you're more likely to find an immediate impact guy in the first two rounds than in round four does it happen of course there are guys who go in the fourth round every year and they turn out to be good immediately also it kind of depends on the position and there are guys who go in the first or second round and don't do anything in the league it's a dart throw the nfl draft is a dart throw but the chances of you hitting in the first round are significantly higher and the first two rounds are much higher than the fourth round. So uh, I, I would get, I would get why they would want to do that if they, if they were to go that route. So, uh, and if they were to move back with, let's say 16, you're probably losing Broderick Jones at that point, but Kalisha can't see probably there. Um, JSN may be there. If not, I, I would think Kalisha, Right, Dewan Jones, someone like that would be in play for the Jets at that spot. Next question is from Clocks on the Rock saying, adding another wide receiver, but is he replacing Davis or Mims? I'd like to see I'd like to see them keep Denzel Mims. Yeah, I think 
you know, with if they were to add another receiver, I think that would allow them to move on from Corey Davis and free up some extra cash, and then they could allocate that $10 million somewhere else on the roster. I, I'm okay with seeing more from Denzel Mims. I don't think he's going to be given a, a starting role, but he there might be a, a use for him. I really liked that pick. Um, when, when they made it out of Baylor a couple of years ago, I thought he had a ton of promise uh, coming out, and he flashed at times as a rookie. Maybe a new system does him better. He had 357 yards in, in eight games. He was, uh, again, pr- pretty solid for, for them as, as a rookie. But second year, a disaster. Last year, a little bit better for him. I think this is his last shot with the Jets, and maybe, you know, Nathaniel Hackett does like bigger receivers, so maybe he is the perfect guy to get something more out of Denzel. If you told me that Denzel would be here longer than Elijah Moore after the 2021 season, I would have said there's no way. But it is what it is. That's the, sometimes that's the reality of the NFL. Weirder things are hap- you know, have happened. I don't think Mims is going to turn into that guy that we thought he was going to be when he was taken in the second round. Uh, but maybe he's a valuable, you know, fourth option as a wide receiver. That I think is absolutely still on the table. Uh, the JD Moore show says, "Who starts at defensive tackle next to Q?" Good question. I would think if they were to add Al Woods, I think he would be the guy that would be my best guess for who would start next to him. Now it'd be a heavy rotation. He started f- all fourteen games for Seattle uh, that he played in 2022 and all 16 games that he played in 2021. Uh, He's a better, he's a run stopping guy. He's not really your pass rusher. Now they did add a pass uh, rusher not that long ago in uh, Quentin uh, Jefferson, who is from the Seattle Seahawks as well. So there's some confusion there, but Quentin Jefferson is more of your rotational like he's more of your Sheldon Rankin's replacement, um, but he's not great against the run. So I would think the more run stopping guy would be there on first and maybe second down. And then Quentin Jefferson comes in in more pass rushing situations. They'll rotate the guys, I think, but I'm not sure the guy is on the roster right now. Uh, the J.D. Moore show. I, I, I don't know that it's a guarantee that the guy is on the roster. They could also add in the NFL draft, and maybe that's the guy who ends up there. But I, I think an Al Woods and Quinton Jefferson rotation on the interior makes sense. And I, if we're going to see it. People are going to say JFM. And yeah, I like when JFM kicks inside, but they really like him outside on the edge on early downs because of how good he is. Uh, at containing the the run and being that edge setter, it's not a sexy thing. It doesn't you know it doesn't show up in the box score, but it's it's an important part of the game. So again, I I get it why they like to have him in the role that they do. Uh, I don't think it's likely that he moves full time inside. Next up is Falzerano eight eight says are J D and Salah the right guys to change the culture and fix the team? Good question. I think yes. I don't think that is a 100% definite yes. But I don't think it's a 100% definite no based on what we've seen so far. But based on what we've seen so far, I am led to believe that I think they, they can get to that point. With JD, I think he's done some nice things in the draft and done some nice things with trades. He does have to improve in free agency. He had a nice find last year in DJ Reed, uh, but free agency has been a little underwhelming for him. And I don't think it's unfair to say for either of those guys that the expectation has to be playoffs now. And I think they do make the playoffs, by the way. But they've done a lot to to change the culture. Guys want to come here to play. Rodgers wants to come here. Odell was interested in coming here. We talked about all the almost Jets and all the players that they've been linked to. That doesn't happen unless they're in this spot, which they're in this spot because of those two guys. It's time to win games now. It's fun. It's been fun, like, you know, building this thing and getting out of the muck. But it, it's um, we're not going to be doing victory laps anymore for a 7-10 and 10 season. It, it's to win division games and the playoff streak. I don't think that at this point, with year four for Joe Douglas and year three for Robert Sala, that is asking too much. I know people say, well, it's your five for Joe. Uh, 2019, you give him a pass, but 20, 21, 22, 
23, year four for him. This will be his fourth draft. It's, it's, it's time to make the playoffs. I think they do it, by the way. So I say yes. I think both guys are here for the next few years at minimum. Let's close out with Christian Morale says, should we make moves for Devin White? Would a couple mid-round picks get it done? I've gotten asked a few times about White. He really is one of the more overrated players. He was taken incredibly high in the NFL draft in 2019, which I think, you know, draft status really helps. Like, he's a name. He's a name more than anything. But his actual play on the field, he had a 14% missed tackle rate last year, which is the same as uh, Quincy Williams, according to PFF. And for linebackers, a qualifying linebackers, which there were 52 of them, they played 50% of the the snaps. I believe it was 1,100 was like the threshold. And you have to have at least 50% of the 1,100 to be included. And 52 linebackers were included. He ranked 15th in reception percentage allowed. He ranked 27th in yards allowed. This is in uh, in coverage, by the way. Touchdowns. He allowed four of them, which was tied for 47th. And passer rating allowed 51st, which was second worst in the NFL. So he misses ta- a lot of tackles, and he's not very good in coverage. And you're going to have to trade for him, so give up probably a, a couple mid-round picks. It's probably enough to get it done. Um, but he's he's also looking for a lot of money. He's looking to get paid. And I think he is very, very overrated. Very overrated. I mean, you look at the Buccaneers defense when they were in their prime, they had, you know, some really nice pieces. But man, like I, I, I don't I, I don't think it was him. I think Levante David was a better guy there. Levante David's a great linebacker. And playing next to him, you would think, oh hey, yeah, pretty pretty good, right? Not really, man. He struggled against the run pretty much his entire career. And he has high missed tackle rates every year. For his career, 12.7 missed tackle rate for his career. 82.4 reception percentage for his career. 11 touchdowns allowed in his four-year career. Over 2,190 yards. And again, inconsistent in the in the run game. He's pretty good at getting pressure. Like it, as pass rush is, you know, pretty solid. I would say that's the strength of his game, but in coverage and run defense, not very good. No, that I would rather bring back Quan Alexander for a fraction of the cost and you don't have to give up draft capital to do it. So, let me know what you thought by the way of the uh Instagram q and I wanted to change it up a little bit and make sure to call in as well and leave a voicemail. The call in numbers on the screen 631-517-0756 in order to leave a voicemail. Uh also before we get out of here, the Talking Jets show is now a YouTube channel. So check out Talking Jets that is down below. We will be doing the uh, live stream for the NFL draft on Ryan's channel, Jets Talk 24-7. But after our little hiatus we do when we come back in July for training camp, all the panel content with myself, Ryan, and Green Bean is going to be on this new channel. So make sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything. Uh, but for now, that's going to do it here for me. I am Matt O'Leary. I'll catch you next time.